I couldn't force her into that. But then when she came and she said, we need to do this, I was like, okay, we're in this together, 100%. We're doing it. And then from then, it was like, bang, bang, bang. Things started happening every day. Plane tickets were booked. House was listed. Sold in four days. Wow. It was incredible how quickly things happened. Everything went fine. And we're on the plane. We're like, is this real? We actually made it out of Canada. So we left with no income, no way of wow. knowing how we're going to do this. We just said we're going to find a way. So, well, as soon as I saw those changes, I was yeah. like, okay, well, here's a country where I could actually see, like, kind of feel a bit of trust that the government's not going to like screw us over in the next six months. Like they they seem to be making positive changes. They, Bukele's talking about freedom and, uh, and you know, what was that quote he said, as the world descends into tyranny, we're going to create a haven for freedom. I was like, okay, that sounds like my kind of place. So, so right away I was telling my wife, we should check out El Salvador. Like if, if we have to go somewhere, why not here? We are live here again from Bitcoin Beach with yet another Canadian refugee who has uh, made his way with his family to El Salvador. And we're going to delve into his story a little bit today and find out why uh, Tom and his wife and kids felt like they needed to leave Canada. And, you know, they bounced around a few other places first, but eventually they have decided to call El Salvador home. So... It's uh, for me, it's been a lot of fun, especially in this last year to see the number of people that are coming from around the world. Uh, a lot of people think, well, it would be mostly Americans, but that's that's not the case. It's actually probably mostly uh, Canadians, uh, even more than people from the U.S. that we've seen here, but also people from New Zealand, Australia, Europe. I mean, it's really from all over the globe. People are feeling like things aren't going the direction they want to see in their country of birth and are deciding that it's time to pick up and uh, bring their family, leave everything they know behind and put down new roots here in El Salvador. So welcome, Tom. Uh, tell us, how, how did you get here? Why, why are we sitting here in El Salvador? Well, first off, uh, thank you for having me, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here on your podcast and uh, I'm a big fan of what, what you've done, what um, the whole team at Bitcoin Beach has done here and it, it's an inspiring thing happening. And, uh, but okay, that's a big question. So <laughs> how do we get here? Uh, well, m my wife and I are, we have three little girls and we were sort of a very typical Canadian family, just, uh, you know, working, raising our kids, uh, very happy with life. We, we had bought a home with almost half an acre of land. We were, you know, planting gardens, building a greenhouse, uh, you know, we loved our life. We loved our home. We, we loved our kids' school. We had a lot going well for us. And you and guys were a pretty normal middle-class family. I think you mentioned yeah. you were an accountant and your yeah. wife was a nurse. So yeah. very like professional, stable jobs that you were engaged in. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then in the spring of 2020, our lives changed dramatically. And I mean, it took us a while before we left Canada. We left Canada in the fall of 2021. So, you know, over about a year and a half later, but during that year and a half, um, a lot of things happened, you know, as everyone knows, as we watched, uh, the, the world kind of descend into madness during COVID, uh, especially developed Western countries, uh, Canada being kind of at the forefront of that. And so, so we were kind of, I mean, with everyone else at, at first, unsure what to think and unsure how to respond and, you know, cautious about about the virus and everything and then but as we as we as time passed we watched what was happening and we're we're looking on twitter and seeing there's college football games in the u.s with eighty thousand people in florida and texas and you know we have to wear a mask in every store and we have to we can't visit with more than 10 people and all the everything's shut down uh, all events are shut down our kids can't do activities and so i remember thinking like, man if i could if i could go to texas or florida or something like that and live freely right now i would totally do that and but we hoped it would get better right summer of 2020 came around and they kind of did get a little better kind of went 
more normal for a couple months and then and then things went bad again in the fall and then same kind of deal kept hoping things would get better we really believed that canada would stay sane right we, i couldn't have predicted what happened um and so so, it's, so that so it was a real surprise to you because from for me as an american we always view canadians as like the reasonable ones the ones that are you know, they're not going to do anything drastic. They're not going to go crazy. They're just kind of plodding along, doing the sensible thing. Mm -hmm. But I watched what was happening up north and I was really shocked. Like, what in the world? And even talking to my Canadian friends here in El Salvador, they're like, no, when we go home, we have to sequester for two weeks. And if we don't, our neighbors will call and report us. Yeah. And I was like, really? Like, that's just a totally different impression than what I had of Canadians. So were you as shocked by this as, as a Canadian? Were, was this something that totally blindsided you or? Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> I mean, so I, I knew Canadians were sort of like a very um, socialist leaning country in a lot of ways. Like they're very proud of their government provided medical care and, and government services and all that. And, I, and I'm very aware of that, um, especially if someone uh, who's more of like a libertarian mindset, I, I knew who Canadians were, but I never thought that they were the type who would be like, I'm going to report on my neighbor if they have their family members over for dinner. And I remember distinctly looking out my window, like worrying that the neighbors would see my sister come visit and her pull into our driveway. And, and we actually canceled the visit one time because the police were outside doing road checks and we weren't sure if they were checking for, you know, if you're in a neighborhood you're not supposed to be in. Because there was a time where you weren't even allowed to visit family. You weren't even allowed to have another person in your household if you were unvaccinated. And it, so, no, I did not see Canadians uh, like losing their minds in the way they did. And it really shocked us. And, you know, even in the spring of 2021, I still remember watching the news and seeing politicians, the prime minister, the health officials in our province saying things like, we will not implement discriminatory vaccine passports. And I said, okay, well, it's, it's bad, but it's not that bad. Like we'll get through this as long as they're not going to do that kind of stuff. We'll, we'll survive. Right. And then we thought, oh, maybe we'll go to Alberta, which is a little bit more of a, uh, free freedom minded province. And by the late summer of 2021, the whole country had sort of descended into madness and vaccine passports were implemented in every province in the country. We were, my wife lost her job as a nurse. Um, our kids were unable to do any kind of activities. They weren't allowed to do swimming lessons, gymnastics, um, dance class, anything like that. We weren't allowed into restaurants. We weren't allowed into any kinds of public events. Uh, we were banned from visiting with family. Like I said, we weren't allowed to have family members in our home. Uh, we were doing that illegally, inviting people over. And, and the final straw came, um, the final straw was when they tried to lock us into the country, right? So they implemented a travel ban on unvaccinated Canadians after October 30th, you were no longer going to be able to leave. Um, then there was a one month gray area during the month of November where you weren't sure they said with a PCR test, you could leave, but we didn't want to chance it. So, so we left October 27th, but like, this was a very quick process. You know, we, so in the summer of 2021, I remember seeing, you know, these politicians who said, we're never going to do this. We're not going to implement vaccine passports. We saw them one by one start doing it. And they started threatening my wife's job and all this stuff. And at, at first we were like, oh, we're going to protest this. We're going to fight this. We're going to stop it. And we went to all these freedom rallies. We went to protest for the nurses. And we really felt like, Canadians were going to stand up and all these people were honking as they drove by our protests. And, and we really sensed that we were going to stop this. And then I realized a little bit later that it was like a tidal wave that was coming over us and there was nothing we could do to stop this. And, and it happened very quickly where my wife got fired. They announced the travel ban. They put in vaccine passports. All this stuff came in within like a month, right? Or two months. So did they give your wife an ultimatum? Like if you are not vaccinated by this date, that, that you're going to lose your job? Yep. And were there any type of exemptions provided, religious exemptions or anything? There was no re religious exemptions. Those weren't happening in British Columbia, but there, there was medical exemptions, but they were very rare, right? You had to basically have a, a severe reaction to the first shot um, or they were going to give you one. And doctors were afraid to write exemptions because they were kind of um, 
pressured by the government and medical authorities. And so it was very difficult to find a doctor that would write an exemption. Uh, but yeah, so she was given an ultimatum to get it by a certain date and she didn't. And you know, a lot of, a lot of nurses didn't want to either when, yeah. when they set that ultimatum, 40% of healthcare workers in, in our region were unvaccinated. And then lots of them said, I'm not going to do that over my dead body. I'm not willing to do that. And, and slowly, little by little, as the deadline came closer, they started to fall, right. And, and just say, I, I can't, I can't lose my job. I can't lose my income. I have to do this. They're single moms and people who are crying and, you know, got it <laughs> even, even though they, they did not want to, right. It was yeah. totally against their will, but, but they felt they had no choice. And so that was very uh, disturbing and sad to watch as people, you know, people that my wife worked with families we knew were felt like they were being coerced into doing something against their will. And we always knew my wife and I were on the same page that we would, we would never do this. Like we would never do this against our will. If we felt that we didn't need this, um, health wise, there's nothing the government could do to us to make us do this, take, take this shot, right? That we would be willing to lose our home. We'd be willing to lose our jobs. We'd be willing to lose everything. Um, with the exception of our kids yeah, <laughs> to, to fight this. And, and so we made that decision early. And so, so in that way, making the decision to leave Canada wasn't that it was still difficult, but it wasn't that difficult because we knew that we were not going to give into this. And if they were going to take a, destroy our lives and allow, and basically make it impossible for us to live our lives and, and do any of the things we wanted to do that, I mean, they basically pushed us, right? It was, we had always dreamed of traveling. So that's something maybe worthwhile to note is that my wife and I, we traveled in South America and Central America like 10, 11 years ago. And we'd spent several years studying Spanish and we had a real interest in Latin America for whatever reason, both of us were fascinated by Latin yeah. America and had a desire to come here. And we had dreams of bringing our children. And we were, we were planning like when they're out of diapers, when they're older, someday we're going to take them traveling across Central South America. And, and then when Canada started to go nuts, we thought, well, maybe we should look at doing that sooner. And I remember talking to our kids saying, you know, we're going to take you guys on a trip around the world. And we started introducing this idea because in our co private conversations with my wife, we were saying, maybe we should go, maybe we should leave, go to Mexico. And, and so, so we were prepping our kids mentally and emotionally for travel during the year of 2021 and they were excited. And, and so when we did tell them we're leaving, it wasn't like a, okay, we need to escape Canada. It was like, we're going on an adventure. We're going to travel. We're going to see new, exciting things. And, um, and were you homeschooling your kids at that, at that point? Were they, I don't know if they were school age or if what they, they were, uh, the two oldest were school age and the youngest had just started preschool that okay. fall when we left. So, um, so did you have to pull them out of a school and, and we did. Yeah. yeah. So they were, they were in a private school. And it was a great private school. It was like many people say it's the best school in that city we lived in and we loved it. It was a fantastic school, fantastic teachers, uh, parents. And did they stay open during COVID or was it all online? Was it? They, they did shut down in 2020. I think every school was required to shut down. The government mandated uh, all of them. And so we did homeschool them in like the second half of 2020. Okay. And, and, but then they opened again in 2021. And so, yeah, uh, but, but we, that was hard for us pulling them out of school. That was, that was really painful because we knew they loved that school. We knew they had good friends. We, we were close with many of the parents, many parents there were like, like-minded and, and supported us and were going through similar challenges. Right. And, and it was, it was hard to leave because we had a great community there, but, uh, yeah, we, we just decided like a big factor for us was we, we just can't bear living a, a winter in Canada. We didn't know how long it would be. It might be a year, it might be two years of telling our children, you can't do anything because of your parents' medical choices. We, we can't put you in any kinds of activities that you want to do. We can't take you out for lunch. We, we can't do any of that because we can't even travel because of the medical choice we made. And we, that, that thought just you know, made us incredibly sad. Right. And, and it was like, we don't want to do that. So, so let's, let's put a different spin on this situation we're in right let's let's see the bright side of what we could do here and it was like well what if this dream of traveling and taking our kids to latin america what if we did that now right what if we had like the adventure of a lifetime and traveled and saw a different part of the world experienced a different culture learned a different language 
And, and instead of this being a negative where we're just having things taken away from us and having our lives destroyed, why don't we spin this into a positive and like have an even better life than what we had? And so it, it was, it was exciting. It was exhilarating and um, terrifying at the same time because we made the decision to leave in like o October 9th or something like that. So and was it like just put things on hold or was it, hey, we're going to sell everything and we're out of here or, or some hybrid of that? Mostly sell everything and we're out of here. Okay. Like we sold our house. We sold our cars. We sold maybe a quarter of our belongings. We did put a bunch of stuff in storage and um, we thought, you know, in case we come back, we don't have to spend $20,000 buying furniture and all these kinds of appliances and things. So we, we have a lot of stuff there in Canada still to this day. Um, although now we're looking at selling it, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it, it was like October 9th to October 27th, I believe is the timeline. It was about three weeks, maybe slightly less where we decided we're going. And, and that's kind of a cool story actually. Like, like, so I wanted to go, I was trying, I was doing a lot of research. I was connecting with Bitcoiners on Twitter who had left where they were and wh whether it was Europe or Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and were living in Central America or Mexico or South America and saying how much better it was. And, and I was like, we could do this. We could totally do this. Maybe we should go. And I was trying to talk to my wife and, but I didn't want to force her against her will. And I remember one day after losing her job, she got officially you know, terminated from her job. And they actually use that language. You're terminated. And, uh, and she came downstairs one day and she was like, like figuratively, like grabbed me by the shirt collar. And she's like, we need to go, we need to go now. Like, let's do this. Let's sell the house, book the plane tickets. We need to get out of here. And, uh, and I remember I was like frozen. I, I was too afraid to move forward because I didn't want to take all that on and be like, I dragged her into this. I, I pushed her to do something against her will that she wasn't ready to do. And that, you know, five years from now, she's going to hold this against me. We lost our house. We pulled our kids out of school. We left everything because of you. And so I couldn't, I couldn't force her into that. But then when she came and she said, we need to do this. I was like, okay, we're in this together. hundred percent. We're doing it. And then from then it was like, bang, bang, bang. Things started happening every day. Plane tickets are booked. House was listed, sold in four days. Wow. It was incredible how quickly things happened. She was selling stuff on Facebook marketplace, like every day, five, five people would come pick up stuff from our house. And it was pretty wild how, how that all happened. And it was surreal. Like we moved all our stuff in a U-Haul to her parents' house, you know, four hours away from our house, a different town. And we drove down to Vancouver to the airport and flew out and like, we're on that plane. We didn't even like, we didn't even know what it would be like to fly. We hadn't flown in two years. And so, we're like, are we going to get on? Are we, my wife's, you know, not feeling all that well. We're like, are, are she going to test positive for COVID or, or something going to happen? And then it, everything went fine. And we're on the plane. We're like, is this real? We actually made it out of Canada. We're on our way to Mexico. <laughs> and so, yeah, we went to Mexico first. Um, spent six months there. I, I'll give you a chance to sort of interrupt. No, no. You're, I, we're here to hear your story. So where, where in Mexico did you wind up? We ended up in the Playa del Carmen, um, what's that, Puerto Morelos, that area, um, just because it was familiar. And one of the Bitcoiners that I reached out to, who was very helpful, uh, he's from New Zealand. He, he was super helpful in answering questions of mine. And he, out of all the people I reached out to, he was the only one who was like, oh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And I'm super grateful for that because it helped give me the confidence to take my kids. Like yeah. it was intimidating to take your little kids um, to a developing nation and one that you're unfamiliar with. And, and so, and especially one where everybody tells you you're going to get killed by drug cartels and stuff like that. Right. So, uh, but I mean, I, I knew it better than that. I, I, we'd been to Latin America in the past. So, but, uh, so we went to Playa del Carmen, that friend of ours was there. Uh, Just we'd been there before. Booked an Airbnb or? Yeah, we booked, uh, a hotel with air miles for like four okay. nights and there was like a nightclub next to us and just like pounding bass. That was pretty <laughs> crappy. But, but then we moved into an Airbnb in Puerto Morelos. We really liked it, that town actually. Um, and then, so we treated this like an adventure, right? We, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know long-term, like I, we had both lost our jobs. I had to leave my job. Uh, oh, so you had to leave this. your job too. Yeah. It wasn't something that you could do remotely. Well, it was a remote job. I was working remotely, but they wouldn't let me. I, I begged and asked and they said, we'd love to keep you. We, we want you to work here, but our company policies won't allow you to take our laptop and our, use our software from outside of Canada. And 
And so I said, well, that's unfortunate, but we're going. And uh, anyways, uh, so we left with no income, no way wow. of knowing how we're going to do this. We just said we're going to find a way. And, and we didn't know if we'd be back in Canada in a year, if this was just going to be like a sabbatical where we go travel and come back when stuff calmed down. Um, but, uh, but we also knew, like, we were serious. We saw how bad this was and how crazy stuff had gotten in Canada that, and I mean, I, I don't know if like everybody listening to this or watching this really understands how bad it got, but like the. 27% of Canadians responded to a poll saying they would favor jailing unvaccinated people. It was that bad. Like we thought they were going to take away our kids. Well, know? I heard stories of them, especially if it was like divorced parents and the one parent wouldn't yes. agree to, to they having the kid vaccinated. The kid, right? Yeah. Yeah. They gave Just, custody based on yeah. that. And so we're like, like how much crazier can this stuff get? And once we're locked in the country, we, we have nowhere to go. And so for us, it was a lot of it. Fear played a big role in us leaving. Um, you know, looking back on it, it's like, OK, it's we were motivated by fear in a lot of ways. But at the same time, we were motivated um, by finding a better life for our family and for our kids and, and being able to raise our children in a in a way that lined up with our values like, so that we were free to do so. Yeah, um, we didn't feel like we could be in Canada. We didn't like the way it was trending, but um, Anyways, I kind of got off track, but what, yeah, so we were in Mexico. Where was I? So we, oh, we ended up like trying to treat this like a vacation because we had, I had no job. It was like, <laughs> let's go travel around Mexico. Let's, I, I could last three to six months off savings. We sold our house, uh -huh. right? And, and so let's, let's go travel. And then uh, we traveled all over Mexico. We bust across uh, Quintana Roo, Yucatan, Chiapas, uh, all, Oaxaca. And then made our way back to Mexico City and uh what I'm just curious, what what were your favorite areas? I, I mean I love Chiapas and yeah. uh that whole region there, Oaxaca. Um what anything that stood out to you guys oh. as places that you really enjoyed? There's lots. We love Mexico. I still I, I really love Mexico and I love to go back and travel through there again, uh, explore other parts. Uh some of our favorites were San Cristobal and Yeah. In it's just Chiapas. the coolest city. It's cool. Yeah. And we ended up getting really sick there. So it kind of put a damper on our, <laughs> our trip. I don't know if it's the water, um, but, uh, but anyways, what other places? Oaxaca, we really enjoyed our stay in the state of Oaxaca, like uh, Huatulco, Puerto Escondido. Um, we stayed at a ranch, uh, I forget the name of the town, Tuantepec, just east of uh, Huatulco. We had an amazing stay there. That, that felt like, you know, a lot, we liked the places that felt a little bit more like real Mexico than, Quintana Roo, like that whole, the part that everybody goes to, Puerto Vallarta, and then also like Playa del Carmen, Cancun, yeah. you know, those don't feel as much like real Mexico, but the, we, we like Guana, Guanajuato, we went up there. My sister spent, I think she did like a semester during university in Guanajuato, oh, yeah. and she, she loved it. She yeah. said it was amazing. It's city. a cool town, yeah. like underground roads, there's like, there's intersections and tunnels. Oh, really? Yeah, it's wild. It's like a whole city underground where you drive, mm. you walk down the steps and taxis pick you up underground. <laughs> Uh, so that's the neat town. Uh, and were you guys meeting other expats along the way yeah. and connecting with other that families cool. that were homeschooling? And how was that part of the journey? Yeah. So one thing we realized very quickly, I don't know how we figured this out, but we eventually figured out that there's all these freedom communities on Telegram and people were like just gathering and meeting up and, and having like lunch together, meeting on the beach. And, and so Playa del Carmen had a huge one. It was like, probably a thousand people or something it, it grew and really yeah at least and that are living there now. well in that are in this group okay i mean i don't know if they used to live there but it's like playa del carmen freedom community okay. or something like that or quintana Roo freedom community um and we met so many great people we met uh most of them didn't have kids we didn't meet a lot of families with kids uh mostly it was single people or couples um because i think a lot of families yeah. are there's a lot of complications. Logist logistics get a little more difficult when yeah. you have kids, especially school age kids. So yeah, we heard a lot of people who were like, "Oh, I can't believe you're doing this with three kids." That kind of thing, right? Yeah. We actually met a German family. Is it four or five girls? They had might have been five. Huge family. They just had twin baby girls, and it was like, "Wow!" We thought what we were doing was hard. Well, okay. There's always people who have it harder than you do. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we we love Mexico. We ended up. Um, and was just just to go back within those yeah. freedom oh, yeah. communities, was there 
was there much crossover with with Bitcoin? Did you did you sense that that was something that a lot of them were you know you lined up on, or was that not really a thing for most of them? That's a great question. So at that time, I haven't really been a full on Bitcoin. I wasn't a full on Bitcoin. Okay. I was still shitcoining. I was still listening to people that were telling you know saying how Ethereum's the new greatest thing and uh, how you know <laughs> like Polkadot and Cardano and all these things that I was. I, I was in it to, uh, you know, hoping to get rich, right? And I wasn't in it for the principles. And but I was, I was going down the rabbit hole. I had read the Bitcoin Standard. I had started following Bitcoiners on Twitter, and I gravitated toward these people because I was a gold bug and I was fascinated by it. And so, um, all that to say that when we were in Mexico, these freedom communities they were very similar minded to us, except when i went to the crypto meetups they were mostly shit coiners and they're talking about like you know mana tokens and these new you know all these kinds of like things that i i was like okay i don't know i i don't even see the value in this and so so for whatever reason like i i tell people that when i when i was in mexico we met fantastic people fantastic people who you know i think they would have had our back in like the worst of situations and and I, they're building like, you know, different freedom minded communities there and all over different places. But I felt like there was sort of a mindset of we're going to we're going to hide from the problems going on in the world and we're going to hunker down and just hide out in our little community until the bad stuff ends. Right. And and when I came to El Salvador, just a segue for a little bit. Um, we felt a completely different vibe here. We felt like people are coming here because they want to build something different. They want to build a better system, a better country, um, a better way of life. And it's like, we're not, we're not hiding. We're not, we're not like hunkering down from whatever the world economic forum, the new world order. Like we're here to, to build something incredible. And there's, there's all these inspirational entrepreneurial people that come here and they're like, let's, let's do something different, right? Let's, Let's try something in a different way. And, and when we were here, it was like that energy was contagious. I was like, I want to be around these people. This is exciting. And then I, we went back to Mexico after being here um, for a couple months visiting. And I remember going back to that and feeling to the, the vibe we got in Mexico from these different freedom communities was like, you know, there's scary stuff happening in the world. Just got to hunker down till, to get through it. And there was no like dreaming, yeah, building, yeah. you know, it was no like, optimism. Yeah. It was just, it was all fear-based. Right. Yeah. And so when you move from that, like to that fear, living in fear and worrying about like what you got to get away from to let's build a better world. Let's set an example for the world of what could be. Yeah. I was like, this is the future I want, right? <laughs> I want my kids to grow up in this kind of community, this kind of mindset of positivity. And, and yeah, it, it was just so energetic and, and, it was like addictive for me to be around this energy. But uh, it's, it's funny you say that because that's what I hear from all the people that have moved here from around the world, that that was really what is drawing them in. You know, Bitcoin's a component of that, but it's much bigger than that. They sense that there's an optimism that this is going to be the center of a more positive world that's going forward, that they're building something here, not hiding from something. Mm. And I think the other thing that's different here is is... It, it really is an, a, a desire to engage and enmesh themselves in the community, not like hide out in a cloister where I think a lot of times in those freedom communities, and I'm guessing the ones that you interacted with, there, there probably wasn't even that many Mexicans that were part of those. It was mostly all expats kind of yeah. gathering together where in El Salvador, there's a real mix of the foreigners that have come in with the locals all working together on this brighter future. Mm, that's true. I mean, there were a few uh, Mexican locals in the freedom communities we encountered, but mostly it was just expats like Canadians and Europeans and Australians and stuff who, would, who had fled their country and were like looking for... Be a lot of them didn't even speak any Spanish, right? A lot of people came to Mexico and didn't speak a word. So no wonder they went to Puerto Vallarta and Playa del Carmen because that was the only place they could get by with no Spanish. And uh, but But yeah, you're right. There's a different kind of vibe here. It's like... And, and, and also seeing that and like understanding that that can happen and growing up in Canada too, seeing like there's communities of immigrants who come and they just kind of want to keep to themselves, mostly maybe don't want to learn the language that much. 
Whereas when you see the ones that like come and they learn and integrate and like become a part of like Canadian society, it was like, wow, this is cool. This is, they're bringing amazing things from their culture yeah. and food and other things. And, and uh, the experience for them is so much richer too. Yeah. Economically, yeah. socially, everything. Yeah. So that's what I hope that we as expats can bring to El Salvador is like, there's a lot of cool ideas that are, can come from other countries that locals here might not know about and, and that you can, you can work with locals and brainstorm and bring the good aspects from other places and, and mix with uh, like the, the local know-how and build something new and exciting. So I think, um, yeah, getting that, that community where you have locals and expats together is huge. So how did you decide to make the move from Mexico to El Salvador? And was that originally a permanent one or were you just coming to check things out in El Salvador? Was it because of the Bitcoin law? Like what was it that drew you guys here? Um, well, one thing was we were unable to get residency in Mexico. So we tried um, and basically all the immigration experts we spoke to said, you pretty much got to go back to Canada. You can apply from in Mexico. You got to go to another country to apply, and it'll be incredibly challenging if you go to do it from some other random country. They, I said, well, what if we go to El Salvador and apply from El Salvador? They said, oh, that's pretty much guaranteed to get rejected. Like fifty percent of them, they don't even look at it; they just throw them in the garbage. And I was like, really? Like they don't even read the applications? And so, so uh, it sounded hopeless for us. We talked to many people, and uh, and we we do know there's people getting it in like less than legit ways. Um, and we didn't want to go that route. Yeah. And so we're like, okay, well, what do we do? So, so we, we spent our six months there on our tourist visa and we said, well, okay, I guess we'll come back to Mexico, but we got to go reset our visa. So where should we go? And I had now kind of almost become like a Bitcoin maximalist it was almost there, 90% there. And I saw that Bukele made Bitcoin legal tender. And I saw that uh, they dropped all COVID restrictions in the, the fall of 2021. So right away, it was like on the radars because at that point, uh, it seemed like the walls were closing in a lot of places. Like when we were looking to leave Canada, I was like, where the hell can we go? There's Mexico and like nothing else. Yeah. And and we didn't want to subject our kids to like PCR. And you tests. guys couldn't even really fly through the US no. because you didn't have. We still can't land yeah. in the US. Did you know that? We <laughs> still cannot insane. land. A like insane. I had to pay a thousand dollars extra flight costs to get my family to Canada and back each way because we couldn't land in Dallas or Houston just to change uh. flights. And so, uh, yeah, it complicates life for Canadians a lot, uh, which is really unfortunate. But uh, but El Salvador was one of the one places you felt like you could go because yeah. you had heard those things. Well, and, as soon as I saw those changes, I was yeah. like, OK, well, here's a country where I could actually see, like, kind of feel a bit of trust that the government's not going to, like, screw us over in the next six months. Like they they seem to be making positive changes. They Bukele's talking about freedom and uh, and, you know, what was that quote he said? As the world descends into tyranny, we're going to create a haven for freedom. I was like, okay, that sounds like my kind of place. So, so right away, I was telling my wife, we should check out El Salvador. Like, if if we have to go somewhere, why not here? Yeah. And and we didn't want like PCR tests. My wife had to do a whole bunch at work, and uh, they're awful, right? We didn't want our kids having stuff shoved way up their nose to cross borders and stuff. So we were avoiding that even, right? And Mexico was the only place in El Salvador, the only places you could go and not have a PCR test at the time and or some of the only ones and so when el salvador opened up it was like okay it's a natural right i'm fascinated by bitcoin so we went we came i'm curious were there were you hearing anything in mexico within the freedom communities there what were any of them talking about what was happening in el salvador or was it more just because of your bitcoin connection or twitter that you were hearing about it i think there was a little bit of um rumblings about it but not much I, I do remember a few people kind of just saying hey did you hear about that because there was crypto people there's crypto people in the in the freedom community in mexico but i didn't meet very many bitcoiners okay i don't know why that is but um i don't i don't know why but i i don't recall meeting any hardcore bitcoiners oh other than the one guy from new zealand that really influenced us to come um but uh yeah so so we came oh so it was twitter mostly twitter i i'd begun following so many bitcoiners on twitter and i was like realizing these are my people these are my people <laughs> and so we came here and we stayed in atami which is like not far yeah from just Dante, five minutes a couple miles away. from here yeah 
Yeah, and uh, we didn't have a car. And, and was that, that you were trying to be near El Zante, or yeah. did that just happen to be where you wound up? Yeah, we what? tried to be near El Zante. Okay. We saw the rent prices here were insane yeah. on Airbnb. <laughs> and so, so I taught me there's a place that wasn't too bad. Yeah. And it was cool. Actually, it ended up being great. I met some fantastic people. Uh, that happened to be staying in the Tommy or Palmarcito, the little beach yeah. right by, right by there, and yeah, I mean that that kind of changed the course of our life. Really, the people we met down there, um, we yeah, I a few specific people, but like um, Timothy Allen, he had me on his podcast. My wife and I were on his podcast. Um, fantastic guy, Bitcoiner uh, from the UK. Is he is he living here? No, no, he went back to okay. the UK with his family, okay. but he loves it here. Yeah, I mean he he I think he's trying to convince his wife to come here, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I met, uh, there's a whole bunch of other like sort of medical refugees. We call ourselves here and there's some staying in a Tommy, they Bitcoiners, they, yeah. they were setting up barbecues and invited all of us over there. And I just connected with a fantastic group of people. And I remember feeling like these people are so welcoming. I could be myself with these people. I can, I, I there's no surface level chit chat. Like right away, you just go miles deep in your conversation. And I was like, I just feel like at home here. Yeah. And, and that month that we stayed in Atami, was like, yeah, it, it really changed our, our mindset. And we were like, why, why don't we stay here? And I was of this mindset, like, why don't we keep traveling? Why don't we go travel all over the world? You know, because we told our kids, oh, we're going to travel the whole world. And, and my wife was like, you know what, Tom, we could travel the whole world and never find the perfect place could always say oh this place isn't quite right there's and so eventually we have to decide on a place we have to choose to live somewhere and she was really like tired of packing up our stuff every week or month and moving the kids and living out of suitcases and shitty airbnb kitchens <laughs> you know um and so she really wanted to settle down and i felt like my kids and my wife saying like daddy we want to be somewhere for more than a month and I was like, I really like El Salvador. And and then we we ended up meeting Jeremy from um, Escape to El Salvador. Uh -huh. So Tim put me in touch with him, and and Jeremy was like, Oh yeah, you can get residency here. You don't have to go back to Canada. And I thought, Okay, this is perfect. So that so, so how has that process been? Just so you know, because there's a lot of people that are wanting to to do that. I know the government right now is looking to make some changes that'll hopefully make it even easier. And, and, but just curious for you going through it, um, if you felt like it was crazy or moderately hard or, or pretty easy. Um, yeah, just so people kind of know what to expect. Uh, I say for us, it was moderately easy. Like it's just some bureaucratic stuff. Hoops yeah. you have to jump through. Uh, we had a few hiccups in ours, but they were pretty minor things like, um, our marriage certificate was too old. Like I've never heard of that before. I haven't been married that long. I'm not that old. 11 years is too old for them to accept. We had to order a new one, things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I hear that there's things happening that are making it more challenging. Um, we have people close to us who are applying for residency right now and they're facing more challenges than we were. Uh, I don't know what's going on exactly, but I know that they're requiring apparently full background checks now with fingerprints and everything. When, when we did it, it you could get the name only really simple one that you could order from here. Um, uh, but I know people are still getting residency. It's happening for us. It, it really was straightforward and, and having someone to help you, I think is yeah. very important because, uh, especially if you don't speak Spanish very well. So, so Jeremy is incredible. He, he navigated that all the difficulties for us. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really think there's anything to, to be afraid of in that regard. It's just kind of typical government yeah. bureaucratic stuff. And it's you definitely, have your documents, right? And, and it's definitely something you can do yourself, but it's usually worth it to, to pay somebody to, to walk through the process just yeah. for the value of your own time and not having to redo things and, you know, not reinvent the wheel. So we always recommend to people, it's better to find somebody that that's yeah. gonna walk at that road with you. Yeah, and we actually have heard of a couple horror stories of people who didn't have very good help, and you know, ended up not knowing that they needed to get some stuff done before they came to El Salvador, or and that it would be save them thousands of dollars. And and you know, if they had known that information, it would have made their lives so much easier. And and so having someone getting into touch with someone who's gonna help you with that residency process before you even come to El Salvador, I would highly recommend. Just because it could, it, even yeah. just getting a background check done where you're in your home country, 
something like that. It, there's other things too, but uh, talk to talk to someone who knows. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise, a lot of times people have to wind up flying, making a special trip to fly back to yeah. to get documents, yes. and so it's so much easier if you get them beforehand. Yeah. Um, what if if you feel comfortable telling us? And I'm just curious as to what what you think people should plan on budget wise to get residency for a family. I mean, what would be? Uh, hmm. I don't um, know if you kept track of that at all, but yeah, I mean, um, d depending on what like what level of service you're looking for. Um, it's probably going to range from like, I'm guessing like two to $6,000 somewhere in there. Yeah. If you go with like a cheap local lawyer who maybe isn't, um, doing as much for you, you can get it on the lower end. Or if you're going with someone who's like, um, more like walking you through each part yeah. of the process. More of a concierge. Like, yeah. So yeah. You're going to pay a bit more for that. But, um, like I said, it could end up saving you a lot of money yeah. in, in the long run. What, um, as far as deciding where to live in El Salvador, what, walk me through your process of how you thought, I know eventually you were kind of close here to, uh, to El Zante. I think now you're more in the, the city and you don't have to dox yourself or tell us exactly yeah. where you're at, but, yeah, yeah. but you know, that's a question a lot of people, you know, have to think through. Do they want to yeah. be on the coast? Totally. Obviously I love the beach. I love the atmosphere here, but the weather is much warmer on the coast. The weather is actually nicer in the capital city. Yeah. Um, if your kids are going to be enrolled in school, like mine, go to school in San Salvador. Oh, so really? yeah, so we so they have to leave the house every day at five thirty in the wow. morning to get to school. So there's there's a lot of different things to try to kind of you know weigh as far as where you're going to choose to make home. So would love to hear the process you guys went through and how you you know went at it. And also, just to let people know like what they can expect for the cost of living here, there's I think a lot of people think that, oh, it's a third world country and everything's going to be super cheap. If you know, that's just the reality if you've traveled in the Americas before, that that's just not the case. I mean, yeah. generally, you know, we're in a global market with things now, and so there's certain costs for things. And if you want, to live super cheap, there's always a very cheap option, but it's probably not yeah. going to be at the standard that you're exactly. used to. And so I think that's been a shocking thing for a lot of people, specifically in El Zante, which has always been kind of a more expensive place just because it's so beautiful and so desirable. They come here and they're like, oh my gosh, the rent's more expensive than it was for me in the US. Yeah. Um, so I always like to be you know, upfront with people about what they can expect. You can live here very cheaply, but you just have to be realistic. Yeah. in your expectations. So I would love to hear how you guys went through those processes on choosing a location, but then also giving people reasonable expectations on cost of living. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where to begin? So, so just quickly, I'll mention that we spent a month in Atami, like I mentioned, then we also spent a month in Comisagua. And, and Atami is kind of a gated beach community. It's yeah. mostly, it used to be mostly vacation homes, although I do think there's more people that are living there full time. Um, especially now with the influx of Bitcoiners in this area. So, yeah. And it's actually a pretty cool community. We liked it there. Um, and then we spent a month in Comasagua in the mountains and we just love the climate there. It was oh, awesome, yeah. but it's so far. Were you actually in Comasagua? No, we were in a gated community outside of Comasagua. Okay. Which, which is beautiful. Which, community. which community? Do you remember the name of it? I wish I could remember the name of it. It was built. I, uh, we heard it was built by a Swiss guy. Okay. And it's these beautiful like wood cabins. I think I know. I, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, we actually just recently bought a coffee farm, um, it, right in that area. It's a little bit, um, outside of Kamasagua, okay. kind of right above, actually right. It's like 40 minutes above El Zante. Okay. So it's at that same elevation, but it's at like 4,500 feet yep. and the weather is just amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm a beach person. I love to surf, but as far as a place to live in the climate, I much prefer for that area. So yeah. Um, was Kamasagua kind of remote for you guys or did it feel Very remote, especially yeah. when we didn't have a car? Yeah. We oh, were you were there without a car. Dependent on a taxi. Wow. And we had a great taxi driver. Our friend Carlos is amazing. But still, you feel like trapped. And, and when a taxi has to drive 45 minutes from San Salvador to pick you up yeah. and bring you into town, you're spending a lot of money on taxis. Um, and then you kind of are like, well, did you just feel trapped where you are? Because you're like, well, we can't afford to taxi every day. So we just hang out in our gated community quite a bit. I, I was working at that point. Yeah. I ended up getting a consulting gig with uh, the company I used to work for as an employee. Okay. They reached out to me. And so that was like a huge blessing and, you know, kind of 
I guess it. So they couldn't have you on as an employee, but they no. could have you on as a, a consultant. Yeah. Okay. And, and I, I guess it just meant like, like what it took was they had a couple people quit right after I left. And it was like, what are we going to do? <laughs> oh, well, there's Tom. Let's ask him if he'll come back. And so it worked out perfectly for both of us. Um, but uh, but that was that, probably actually nice, too, because you got a while without having to worry about work. Yeah, it was only when, six weeks. In the initial part, you yeah. were able to just travel and enjoy yeah. and then come back to your job. So. That's true. Like we took the kids snorkeling yeah. and things like fun things like that. And and we were able to fully be with them every day, play in the pool. And, and I didn't have to worry about work, which was nice because it was a huge change. But uh, I was going to say that like in Comasagua, we realized that climate was so good. Oh, yeah. We wanted th that. And we love the beach, but it's so humid. And when you're not from that kind of a climate, it's, it's hard to adapt to. And so like I would warn anybody who wants to come live on the beach, it's, it's quite humid. It's hot. Um, we love staying on the beach. We're actually moving to the, the coast and the, the beach again here very soon. And because the community here is fantastic. Yeah. And my wife, it's really important for her to be around other people, other families with kids. And, and so she was adamant. She wanted to live here, even, even though we're not as big fans of the climate. But we've actually been living in the Zaragoza area for the past uh, five months, I guess. Um, and it's a lot cooler up there. It's like halfway up to San Salvador and it's higher up, like 500, 600 meters of elevation. And you get a nice cool breeze. It's not as humid. And I really like the climate up there. So, so if, I'm curious as to the difference between there and Comasagua. Because I've always wondered, Zaragoza, it's not, it's not that high. No. I mean, it's definitely higher. So... Komosago is way cooler. Okay. W like way. But Zaragoza was still reasonable. I mean, did you have to yeah. run your air conditioning all the time or was it uh, pretty livable? Well, we had air conditioners in each of our rooms and we would run them at night, but we wouldn't set them very low. Yeah. We'd set them at like 26, yeah. 27 and uh, Celsius. But uh, um, anyways, so during the day I would just run it if I'm working in my office. Okay. But other than that, like downstairs we had a fan that we'd occasionally use but it was actually a pretty pleasant climate most okay. of the time um it's still like for canadians comasago climate or a taco i love yeah. a taco that yeah. whole uh ruta de las flores region we love it up there and if it was closer to a community of bitcoiners expats um because then we would consider living there but like when you're an expat and you come and you know your spanish is so so as much as you want to like connect with the locals, it's harder, right? It's harder to have deep conversations yeah. in, in Spanish. And so you just naturally navigate towards the expat community or locals who speak English. Yeah. And so, um, in that regard, like, um, being, being close to the beach community here, like in El Zante or San Blas or, or these communities, there's a lot of expats, um, a lot of similar minded people, a lot of Bitcoiners and San Salvador has a big community too. Zaragoza is kind of weird. It's it's almost like a suburb of San Salvador. So the people there seem more like city-minded people. Yeah. Um, They're more like commuters that are yeah. commuting. Yeah. Yeah. It's just more like it's cheaper to live yeah. in Zaragoza and uh, you get a little bit more space maybe. So so people move to Zaragoza, I think, for that reason. But but there's not a ton of expats there. Not We haven't met any Bitcoiners really in, in Zaragoza. But uh, it's, it's a good place, I think, if you can't handle the climate. The, the humidity on the coast and if you want something a little bit cheaper. So Zaragoza is a little bit more affordable than than staying down here. Yeah. Or than San Salvador. It's yeah. It's, yeah. It's yeah. it's definitely the more budget friendly option. But I But you want a car if you're there. Yeah. For sure. For sure. You feel very chapped yeah. and isolated if you don't. Yeah. And I think that um, you know, like you were saying, in the coast it it does have the advantage of it's much more it's a lot easier to integrate into the community. That's one of the things I love about Alzante. There's definitely a lot of expats here, but they're not like in a separate enclave. They mm. mix with the locals and it's, you don't have those divisions that you have in other places. There's no, especially in Alzante, there's no gated communities. Everybody kind of interacts with each other and there's not really a distinction made between Salvadorans and, and expats. And so for me, that's just made it so much more enjoyable that, that, you have that. Um, and so that's, I think, one thing that really draws people to the coastal communities. Yeah. Where in the city, it's a little bit harder because even the the Salvadorans there, their, their lives are busier. They're usually working longer hours at jobs. Life is done more. You get in a car, you go somewhere back where in the beach community, you, you know, even people who have cars might not use it, but once a week, you're walking yeah. everywhere, you're interacting with everybody. So I think that's something important for people to really think about, you know, what kind of life do they want for themselves? And especially if they have kids for their kids. 
Mm. Um, are you guys still carless? No, no, thank goodness we're not. We bought a car uh, about my less than a month, I think, after coming, maybe a month after we got here, and we're okay. so we we actually you might want to go on this sidetrack later, but we went back to Canada for my sister's wedding while they still had a lot of these crazy COVID restrictions on, and we got in big trouble with the Canadian government, and we're in a lawsuit right now with them. <laughs> all this, uh, or they're taking us to court. But uh, I'll, I'll let you decide if you want to go down that well, route. Well, yeah, later. I mean, but, you've, you've you've teed it up, so you got. <laughs> but just wait. So we came back to El Salvador after that, and that's when we moved to Zaragoza okay. in uh, September, and we've been living there since. We got we um, bought a car about a month after, and it's it's fine with a car because you're like 20 minutes from the city, yeah. you're 20 minutes from the coast. We could easily get around. Um, but as far as like living there, I don't like the fact that you feel like you're just in this gated community. You can't go anywhere unless you drive. Yeah. You can't walk anywhere. You can't go running anywhere other than your community. And it just it feels a little bit too cookie cutter. It's like a it's like the new townhouse complexes they're building in um, Canada and the United States, probably where everything's just the same. And yeah, I, I just don't like it. I like here. There's there's more like uh, unique homes and neighborhoods and things just feel more like real and natural here and people are way more casual here like just things like worrying about having like your perfect washed car like people are washing their cars every day <laughs> where i live and so worried about how they present themselves and and people are so much more relaxed here i love the vibe on the coast so yeah. it's i i sometimes forget and i'll show up to something in the city and i i look around i'm definitely the worst dressed because you know, everything's so casual on the coast, but you show there, they dress nice for everything. Like you yeah. said, there our cars are always the one. I don't notice it here, but we drive it there and like see our dirty car in the, yeah. the parking lot next to all these shiny cars. So I definitely uh, understand what you're talking about there. Yeah, yeah, we feel like we don't fit in. <laughs> so tell tell uh, the audience about your experience uh, buying a car here, uh, because yeah. that's, that's one of the, it's always housing and cars. These are the questions people have. And so that's one of, the things we want to take advantage of in this, uh, you know, podcast series is letting people know the realities, the good, the bad, yeah, the yeah. ugly of what life is like here. Yeah. So everything feels 10 times harder in a new country, even though it's not 10 times harder. It just feels like it because you're like, oh, my home country. I know where to go. I know to, yeah. where to get insurance. I know where to register my car. I know where I could buy one. But what the process is, but not knowing any of that, you know, I so befriending locals. Um, and I mean like actual like Salvadorans, I, we have a great friend, like I mentioned our driver, Carlos, he, he's just a, a fantastic guy. Right. And just like, so trustworthy and honest. And, and I, so I would like gladly ask him for his advice and, and he was happy to offer it. And, and, you know, he was able to take me around all these car dealerships and, and I speak, uh, decent Spanish. Right. So, so it's harder, I think, if you speak none. Yeah. But I would highly recommend having someone with you who could translate and, you know, negotiate and, and do all that stuff because, um, like we visited probably 15 car dealerships and I wasn't comfortable, like just buying from some random private person yet. Um, but, uh, yeah. And then, so he walked me through the whole process of like, okay, now we need to go to the lawyer who's going to register. So, in your so name just out of curiosity, did you buy a Dehensia uh, vehicle here? Did you buy one of them? I think they call it Traido, like that they brought in. I don't know if oh, you know the distinction between the two. Cars brought from the U.S.? Yeah. yeah. So so probably 80% of the vehicles in El Salvador are ones that were wrecked in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to such an extent that it wasn't worth fixing them in the U.S. And so they ship them to El Salvador where the cost of labor is a lot cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. And cars are actually more expensive and it's worthwhile for them to fix these cars. Yeah. They can do an amazing job. Um, you see the before and after and you're like, wow, I can't believe they could do that. But a lot of times there are issues, you know, you know, things not lining up right, you know, just little issues. When something's been smashed to smithereens and you put it back yes. together, it it it's never quite the same, but that is the majority of the vehicles here. Yeah. And if you want one that was actually sold new here and then resold used, you're, you're going to pay a significant premium for that, to, you know, that peace of mind of knowing that it hadn't yeah. been wrecked. So I'm not sure how that fit into your thinking and if uh, how you approach that. Well, one thing I noticed was cars are more expensive here than they are in Canada, like just Every place we looked, it was like, wow, I could buy this for a thousand, two thousand dollars less in Canada. It's shocking. You yeah. know, like you said, people come here expecting things to be cheaper and then they get here and they're like, oh, wow, some things are more expensive, which is surprising. So it was it was 
difficult, but like we were adamant we had to have a car. So it's like, we're just going to find the best. So we kind of had a price range of like, okay, no more than eight grand. And, and we began looking and so I'd heard a lot of people say, don't, you know, be very wary of cars that have been, um, in accidents in the U S and that. And so I, thankfully like Carlos had recommended his mechanic who he said it was like super awesome, trustworthy guy. And, and so we, we took some cars to him, like the dealers let us take cars to this guy and he scoped them out for us. And one car we brought to him was like, oh, this is sketchy. Like they disconnected the computer and warning lights aren't popping up on the screen because they've disconnected these cables. And I was like, okay, that's, we're definitely not buying that yeah. car. They're hiding something. But then we took a different car there and, and he was like, this car looks like it's an awesome shape. And, and it ended up being a car brought from the States, but it wasn't in any accidents. It was, it was a car brought from the States. And we, uh, yeah, so we had this checked out by the mechanic and he's like, this thing's in fantastic shape. Like it doesn't need any work done on it. And we took it to the insurance place. And I remember the guy saying, um, wow, like usually all the cars we see from the US are like beat up and have been, in, but this one looks great. Like that's rare. And so we were, we were super fortunate, but like, I, I still feel like the car was expensive and uh, we could have got it cheaper. It was a 2013 Hyundai Elantra. And I'm still like <laughs> not happy about how much we paid for this thing. But at the time, like we could, it's hard to find cars yeah. for cheap here. Really yeah. is. If you up your budget to like 10 grand US, you can find some pretty good cars, but like seven, six, seven grand, it's hard to find something. So um, we're happy with what we got. Although if you're buying a car here, I would recommend you get something with a bit of clearance because the number of times I've scraped my exhaust on speed bumps and different things on the roads is, uh, you know, I can't even count. So I wish I had something a little higher up. Yeah, no, it's uh, our first vehicle here was a Toyota Corolla. Oh, yeah. And uh, by the time we got rid of it, it sounded like a Harley because we had done so much damage to the muffler from, you know, banging yeah. it up on things. And so it was uh, it would backfire and it would rumble. And it was it was pretty funny. People would expect some big truck to roll up and we'd roll up in this little beat up Corolla. Hmm. So it was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, vehicles, that, that is something that, you know, we advise people to kind of really think through longer term what you want out of this and be realistic about the budget. Like you were yeah. saying, it is more expensive here. And if you think about it, it, it does make sense. El Salvador is a smaller market, so they don't have the economies of scale yeah. of bringing in massive amount of vehicles like they do totally. in other places. And they're not manufacturing um, them here like yeah. they do in Mexico or the US or Canada. So it's, um, yeah, it's definitely more expensive. The, the one exception I would say to that is if you buy a new, a brand new diesel uh, 4x4 pickup, yeah. you can get those for cheaper than you would get them in the U.S. Really? And I'm not oh. exactly sure why that is. Maybe they don't have all the safety requirements that they require them in the U.S. to have or the smog issues or mm. I'm not sure what, but you can... You can get like a base model um, 4x4 diesel pickup for the high 20s, wow. um, where in the US, you know, you'd pay at least 35000 for something like that with four wheel drive and diesel engine. So that is the one thing I tell people. If you're going to buy a new vehicle, definitely look at the quad cab 4x4 pickups. Okay. And, and they hold their value too. It's okay. crazy. I mean, we've, we've bought a, a couple for the project. And I think at that time they were like, 24,000 and we could probably sell them right now for what we paid for them just because they really hold their value. That's so awesome. if you're, if you're going to buy a new vehicle, we recommend people look at that. Otherwise, you know, you, you, the, the SUVs and some of those things on the used market, you can get a really good deal on them. If you buy them new, you're going to pay probably 20 to 30, even 40% more than you'd pay in the U S on, yeah. on SUVs and passenger cars. Yeah, no, that's cool to know about the diesel trucks. I actually had a really interesting conversation yesterday with a Bitcoiner who made me think of something totally new that I hadn't thought of with buying cars. But he was saying that in El Salvador, they sell a lot of like lower, uh, cheaper model cars that they wouldn't make available in Canada or the US because they know people can get access to credit yeah. and pay more. But he was saying there's cars here like Suzuki's and stuff that you can buy for like 11 or 13,000 brand new with a warranty. I don't, I haven't looked into that myself, but now I'm curious to see because if you could buy a new car for $13,000 versus a 2013 for you know, eight, yeah. uh, that becomes attractive. So, so it might be worth investigating that. No, there's, I mean, even some of the, the major brands like Toyota, they, they sell, um, and Hyundai has a lot of them in the, this lower range. I mean, you, 
you know, you usually get what you pay for. Yeah. So you do have to look. A lot yeah. of them will have um, horsepower levels that yeah. that Can't you would never even <laughs> you would never even think about doing yeah. in the U.S. It's like an eighty horsepower vehicle, and which if you're just in San Salvador and just driving around, that is fine. But yeah. you know, for myself, I like to be able to pass cars and yeah. you know those sorts of things. So uh, yeah, That's you just got to kind of look at all the variables there. But yeah, they definitely sell models here that are much cheaper than you would find anywhere else. But for comparable models, you have to expect to to pay more. Yeah, yeah. and sure. for some reason, Toyotas here like have some golden status. So if you buy a used Toyota, you're gonna pay way like a huge premium okay. versus like a ford or a chevy or uh yeah the, the the american models don't hold their value very much compared to the the japanese models they definitely i mean it's a little bit like that in the u.s but here yeah. it's it's really like that so, okay well, um it's kind of funny so you guys have a vehicle yeah and then what led you guys back to the coast was it just the being able to be part of the community or kind of what was your process did you think about moving to san salvador how much did pricing come into play and and if you could just share broad ranges with people of what they can expect to yeah. what you've seen if you've looked at different rental places in zaragoza versus yeah. san salvador versus the coast so uh okay so first off i want to mention that we actually bought property here not too far from Bitcoin Beach, okay, um, you know, like within a half an hour of Bitcoin Beach and a little higher up elevation. And so we wanted to be closer to this area because we want to develop that property. And so that played into our, you know, our decision uh, because driving from where we are now, it's like an hour drive to get to get there. And yeah. it's just it just gets annoying to do that much driving um, like the highway here. You know, you're stuck behind trucks often and I hate driving it in the dark because there's no lights anywhere. And so, so yeah, that we wanted to be closer. Uh, the community was big. Like I, I liked the climate in Zaragoza. I was kind of okay living there. Uh, but my wife was like, she's a very much a people person. I'm like, I could be a hermit. I, I could go hang out with people once a week and yeah, be fine. That's how but, I am. But okay. if she doesn't see people for three days, she's like kind of freaking out. And, uh, and so I said to her, I said like, look, I clearly you really want to move to the coast and be closer to friends. So if you want to, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'll do that. Even though I don't like the humidity, I'll go. And so it kind of worked in a lot of ways, right? She wants to be there. There's more families with kids, expat families with kids. Uh, we're closer to the community in Zante, which we love. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a great Bitcoin community in San Blas, great Bitcoin community here in Zante. And uh, and then we have property fairly close by, which we want to develop. And so we're going to be there often, right, over the next year. So all that played into it. And then... Um, what like what should people expect to uh, you know set aside for for rent in those different places? I it's been forever since I've looked at rentals or yeah. anything like that, so I don't even know where prices are right now. But I'm assuming you have some idea. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe we're paying gringo prices. I don't know, but uh, like I know uh, you know some people say that like that people try to charge you more because they think you pay more. I don't know if that's true or not, but we maybe to a little extent, but I don't not like other places where they really try to gouge you. Yeah, I, I don't I don't I haven't so. encountered that. That's so, how I feel, yeah. too. And, you know, so but so uh, I think some people think that just because the prices are higher than they think they should be. And, yeah. And so they think, oh, we're getting gringo. You're like, no, that's just the price, the price yeah. here. Yeah. And so like we've heard of stuff in like, say, the 950 to 1100 to maybe 1200 range in zaragoza uh -huh. a month um we're talking like a three to four bedroom home in a gated community um with air conditioning and like very like developed world yeah standard modern apartment. conditions yeah you feel very comfortable if you're coming from a western country um and like with cool facilities like pools and playgrounds for the yeah. kids and all that stuff um on the beach we actually like heard of people paying quite a bit more like 13, 14, 15, 1600 for a house in like San Blas. And I know Zante is even more expensive. And, and Zante doesn't have like a lot of the homes for families, right? There's not a yeah. lot of that. And uh, so that's why like we stayed in a Tommy. There's more that there. Um, but yeah, so we didn't originally want to move to the coast because we're like, well, we can't afford it. It's too expensive. We heard of people paying 14, 1500. And so we said, well, if we could live there and pay less. So we found a, a place for like 1100 a month. Um, and we found a few. This one doesn't have a pool, which was, it's a great house. We love the house, 
but the drawback was it didn't have a pool. And yeah. so you might have to make that kind of a sacrifice, but there's a community pool. It just doesn't have its own. Like most people on the beach won't have their own pool because it's so hot and humid. Yeah. Yeah, you got to yeah. jump in the pool yeah. seven times a day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we're paying like, um, I mean, we, we were being offered places in Zaragoza in the same range, right? And we're like, okay, well now we could live on the beach in uh, for a similar price. And so it's pretty attractive. I'm assuming the place in Zaragoza was a little nicer than what you have in the beach, or is it pretty similar? Actually, we like our place better on the okay. beach now. And oh, nice. so, I mean, yeah, the community's kind of more, they're like letting it go a little bit. You know what I mean? Things, the public areas aren't being maintained yeah. to the same yeah. level. Whereas in Zaragoza, it was like brand new. Everything was built in like the last five years probably. And everything is like meticulously maintained, almost like too much. Yeah. Where you yeah, feel yeah. like you're in an artificial <laughs> environment, uh, like fake grass in the playground and things like that. Uh, but but overall, we're we're quite happy to be making the move just the community is the biggest thing honestly we love the community the, the reason we moved to el salvador is because of the the awesome community that's building here like you have you have people coming from all over the world like um interacting like building community with locals right and there's just this like amazing melting pot of I ideas and cultures and people and and there's exciting things happening here and and so the closer you can be to that i think the better there's fantastic places in el salvador like i said we love a taco Ruta de las Flores, uh, Apaneca, Huayua. If I could just like, based on climate, I would love live up there. Yeah. I would buy property up there. Um, but we don't know anybody up there. Yeah. And so we're trying to find the happy medium. Like, how do you get up in the mountains a little bit, be close to community so you can, you know, make a day trip and, and come visit people. But uh, yeah, and I don't know I, if that And I think over time, communities will develop in those places mm -hmm. as as expats continue to flood in to El Salvador and start, you know, planting their flags in different places and engaging the local communities, um, I think you're going to start seeing places like a taco or yeah. um, we have a, a dream to do something in the mountains above El Zante to build a specifically Bitcoin community there uh, with the weather's good, mostly because I want to live there <laughs> because yeah. I like the weather there. Um so I think you're going to see more and more of those things spring up. But for now, really, the the nexus of everything is on the coast. I think a lot of it because of what how this thing started in El Zante. And, and so you have a lot of momentum here. So it seems like the majority of people either are going to be on the coast or some people do feel like they need to be in San Salvador because they have, you know, they're operating businesses and they have to have meetings with people all the time. And so, you know, it seems like people are kind of divided between either living in San Salvador or living on the coast right now. But mm -hmm. I think that'll broaden out as things go on. I think you're right. I think it needs some, um, you need some adventurous Bitcoiners to yeah. venture out to a place like a taco and be like, I'm planting the flag. I'm orange pilling the vendors. I'm starting this. Right. And I even thought about like, well, maybe that's, you know, something we could do, uh, but, but I know who my wife is and I know she needs community <laughs> and, uh, I know she'd go crazy if we moved to someplace with no expats and, yeah. you know, so you gotta, you gotta kind of balance these things in a relationship and a family, right? Look after everybody's kind of needs. Definitely. And wants. Well, you know, they say ha happy wife, happy life. Yeah. And, uh, and the opposite is true also. Yes. So, um, yeah, no, definitely. You want to keep the whole family in consideration. Um, you spoke of, of orange pilling, uh, you know, vendors and stores curious as to what you found as far as the availability to spend Bitcoin in El Salvador, um, were you able to buy your car in Bitcoin? Was that even something on the table? I know we bought a vehicle for the, the, um, for the project this last week from a new car dealer and we were able to pay for Bitcoin. Oh, nice. And I think it's the the first new car dealer that's accepting wow. uh, Bitcoin. So we bought a Mahindra 4x4 pickup truck. Um, I think it was like 29,000 for, and that's what one of the ones I was talking about. Okay. You can get these 4x4, you know, basic rugged quad cab pickup trucks for, for you know, a decent price for a new vehicle. Yeah. And so I'm excited that they're on board now that other Bitcoiners can now have an option to buy a new vehicle. I have seen some used ones for sale in Bitcoin, but I know it's kind of hit and miss. Mm. So what's been your experience? How much are you spending Bitcoin or are you still living in dollars or what's what's life like for you? Yeah, good question. Uh, well, so to answer the car part, um, no, they wouldn't take Bitcoin, although I wish they had because just for the convenience factor, like and that was a perfect example of problems Bitcoin solves because I, I didn't even have a Salvadorian bank account yeah. at the time. 
and my wife didn't, right? And so we were limited to like 800 Canadian or 800 US dollar withdrawal per day. And we need eight grand to pay for our car. And so we're like going to the ATM every day, right? We have to go day after day. Been there, after done day. that. And take out this eight grand in cash. Yeah. And now you're like holding these giant Ziploc bags full of giant wads of $20 bills because that's all they give you. And uh, walking into the place, you know, where you got to do the car transfer. And were they even willing to accept the cash? Because I've had, yeah. I did that before. And so I had the cash and they're like, no, we want a cashier's check. And so. Wow. No, they asked for cash. Okay. So, so yeah, because sometimes that's an issue too. Yeah. They're like, no, we don't want the liability of having the cash. You have to get a cashier's check. I'm like. So I, w I remember the one time I went went to the bank said I need a cashier's check and they're like well do you have an account here and I was, no no we can't do it okay well I want to open an account they're like are you American yeah no we won't open an account for you I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so I think at that time we had to actually meet the the seller in the bank and give them the cash and let them deposit it in their account because they were it was just super weird and super if you try to do wires it's a pain in the butt so mm -hmm. I definitely get what you're saying just from a convenience factor. Yeah. And yeah, that's like, what we were selling to the dealer the other week. We're like, and after we went through the process, the dealer's like, wait, we're, we're done here? It's that like, easy. It's that easy? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, if I would have tried to wire this, it would have been a major headache. It would have yeah. got Three held up. business days, maybe. Oh, and it would have got held up, and they would have wanted substantiating yeah. this and that, and it would have been this huge process where now we yeah. like, we're done. It's clean. Yeah. It's easy. So Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing when you pay with Bitcoin. Yeah. And, and so... I try to use it as much as possible. I pay for my surf lessons, Bitcoin. I, um, we buy our organic food deliveries from Yektanel, which is a great place to get food. They deliver to your place. Would they accept Bitcoin? Um, we, I pay for pupusas in Bitcoin, like little things like that. Uh, but I, I have issues, you know, trying to pay at like Puma gas stations and super select those grocery stores. Like those, the chains are the ones that uh, I find more challenging. Yeah. Uh, the Walmarts, things like that. They supposedly do accept it, and it's most often Chivo Wallet. And I don't know. I and they create that Chivo dollar code, you know, yeah, invoice yeah. for you. And you're like, no, that's not yeah. Bitcoin. And they're like, no, this is the only one we do. Yeah, and yeah. It, yeah, yeah. So uh, no, it's so frustrating because you go round and round. You're like, no, just hit the Bitcoin button. Yeah. They're like, no, no my boss it. said only dollars. You're like, he can still convert it to dollars, but yeah. you have to accept it like this. But there's this disconnect, and so. I've gone round and round with the folks at Chivo, like you need to get rid of that stupid Chivo, inner Chivo invoice yes. and do like the rest of the wallets do. You can still have it if it's a Chivo wallet to a Chivo wallet where it's just a, you know, behind the scenes balance transfer rather than a, a actual Bitcoin transaction. But you need to use real Bitcoin QR codes so that other yeah. people can pay. Yeah. So it's it's been, um, we'll just keep grinding them down until they get so tired of hearing from us that, that they make those changes. Yeah. I do know that Athena finally yeah. Price Mart, right? made the changes at Pricemart, yeah. which is huge because that's, um, you know, we do a lot of our shopping at Pricemart. So the fact that they have lightning payments there mm. is, you know, definitely a huge win. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's it. Like, as long as people keep uh, bringing up the issues and saying, like, look, Please fix this. We're yeah. trying to spend money at your store and tourists come here wanting to spend it. And, and like you gave the example of buying the truck. Okay, so somebody comes here as an expat. You don't have a bank account set up yet. Wire transfers are a pain in the ass. And it's like, I need a car. Look, I'll give you $10,000 if you'll just take my Bitcoin. And like, why would you not be those dealers and, and, and use car salesmen that are jumping on that yeah. right away? Because if you are providing, making it easier for foreigners to buy cars, well, they will flock to those places. Yeah, that you'll, are you'll corner that. That's what we told this guy. Like, yeah. you will have all the Bitcoiners, all the expats that are coming in will come buy from you because it's going to be so much easier. So this is, yeah. gives you an, a competitive advantage. And I think they actually got it. The guy, the owner of the dealer seemed very sharp very like reasonable and it was like yeah we've been thinking about this we just didn't really understand it but now we're seeing it's even easier than we thought and so i he he seemed convinced he's like once the other bigger dealers realize how easy it is they'll be on board too he, mm. so i think he saw kind of a little window of opportunity for them to you know gain that reputation before yeah. everybody else started embracing it totally because bitcoiners are happy to share that yeah like support this guy who's taking bitcoin this you know this yeah. business were you able to purchase your property in Bitcoin or any other no, big things like that? No, to be that, honest, or? we didn't even try that. It was a, it was an elderly gentleman okay. um, in, from a small town. So we we just kind of didn't think that was going to be a possibility. Yeah. So we didn't even go there. Um, 
And not to mention, well, I mean, yeah, he, he was giving us time to pay, right? So it was an overextended time period. And um, yeah, we, no, to be honest, we just didn't push for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, sometimes you just got to work with the reality of the yeah. situation. Yeah, and uh, by that point, we'd already set up a Salvadorian bank account. Okay, and we okay. were able to, you know, use like transfer wise and stuff to get money here relatively easily. Once you figure it's it out, it's still kind like, of a pain. You though. have to keep them below a certain dollar yeah. amount or they get flagged yeah. and you got to answer questionnaires and it's annoying as hell. It is. Bitcoin is way better. I mean, <laughs> I've had it where they're like, oh, we need your last three years tax returns. I'm like, I don't carry those around with me. Like, <laughs> and then you're like, well, now they want you to submit it to them and now they have all your information. You don't yeah, know yeah. where it's going to go to yeah. or how it's going to be used. Exactly. That they're going to start, you know, somebody's going to start setting all these credit lines up, you know, using your name and all your information. So, with Bitcoin, it's just so much cleaner, yeah. so much cleaner. Yeah. Um, has there been anything that have made you guys second guess making this home? Has it been mm. things that have been like tough of like, maybe we should go back to Canada. Maybe it's not worth it. No. Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you like, I guess maybe like the one negative uh, or whatever that I've thought about, but uh, in general, no. I have no desire to go back to Canada whatsoever. All I see is when I see what's happening in Canada, I see it getting worse and I see it going further downhill. And so I don't see a future there. I, I speak to Canadians every week who are contacting me and saying like, hey, I'm thinking of moving to El Salvador. Hey, I'm coming to visit. I have like four people coming this month who are getting in touch with me, who want to connect with me, who I have either been here before and they're coming again or they're coming for the first time. And they're serious, like very yeah. legitimately serious about moving here. And, and it's, it's like most Canadians are oblivious to this that there's a, like uh, the thing is there's a culture of fear in Canada that people don't even feel that they can speak freely and they self-censor and so I think there's this thing going on I know there's this thing going on where people don't even tell their neighbors that they're like scared shitless about where the country's headed that they're actually thinking of leaving yeah but I hear more and more people saying this and so um Sorry, uh, I got off track. What was your question? No, again? no, but we had, uh, just to, to go a little deeper down that rabbit hole, that we had uh, somebody at our, our church last year that we, yeah. tend, we attend a church in San Salvador and met this guy, young Canadian guy, and was asking his story. And he said he fled Canada because he was posting some stuff on YouTube and he had people show up at his house and tell him wow. that, you know, he was going to be arrested if he continued to post these yeah, things. Yeah. And yeah. He, he was like freaked out. He... <laughs> So he just like hopped on a plane and came down here um, and he hadn't like set anything up. And then he got here and all he had was Canadian dollars and he couldn't find any place to exchange these Canadian no dollars. Oh, no. So he was like freaked out. He's like, I have money, but it's on Canadian dollars and I can't exchange them anywhere. We finally found, we connected him with a, a hotel here that deals with Canadian guests. And, you know, sometimes when they're leaving, they want to exchange their dollars back. Yeah, and yeah. so he was able to to make that exchange. But I was like, what do you mean? He's like, no, they came to my house and said that I could go to jail for what I was posting. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's before these new bills are trying to pass, like this bill, I think it's called C Bill C-11, that they're trying to basically give the government the power to regulate your social media feeds, right? And decide which content you can't be shown. And which. so this is like, it's trending in a very dark direction there. Um, so, I, so we'll probably see more and more Canadians coming to El Salvador that are looking to... Yes, yeah, yeah. they're... they're um, I believe, and I've heard from reliable sources that the Canadian government is very concerned about the flood of Canadians coming here and they're looking to make it more difficult. And I've already heard that they're, you know, requiring more extensive background checks or the embassy won't uh, authenticate it and things like that. And so uh, what was an easier process for us is now becoming more challenging, but I think they're just trying to slow, yeah. slow the flood of people coming. Because, I mean, honestly, I don't think they can stop it, right? Like, they can't just say, like, oh, we're now closing our borders. To well, anybody. I don't know. They, Countries have done it in the they past. Could. So. Yeah, they could. But, uh, yeah. I mean, it looks pretty bad, yeah. right? And so I don't know if they're able to do that. But they're trying to slow it down for sure. Um, so I do think a lot of people are coming. Like, I think that the people who have come are just sort of the pioneers. And, like, I know you've been here a lot longer than, you know, we have. But, I mean, as far as, like, the sort of COVID refugees <laughs> like us, we're... I think we're the pioneers who came in the last two years, right? And and now we're posting whatever, whether it's like my wife's blog, Substack, or other people that we know, like uh, two people in paradise or Nikki and James or and people that are posting on YouTube and showing how good life is here and how safe it is. And, yeah. and it's destroying this narrative that people have in Canada where it's like, you're going to die if you go to El Salvador. You're going to get like, <laughs> you're going to get shot. And 
there's still this like my sister and her husband came they're actually with us right now staying with us and they were told stuff like that like, you're going to El Salvador like I hope you come back alive things like that right and and so the people living here who are posting stuff on social media are showing the rest of the world that the mainstream media narrative about El Salvador is false it's not true yeah right that it's an incredible place to live we don't feel in danger we have three little kids here we walk around and we drive around the city and we don't have any fear living here and yet there's so many people who who do and even the canadian government i don't know if you heard about that but they put out an increased travel warning about el salvador warning people that it's more dangerous than ever <laughs> and you know it wasn't in 2016 when it was like tons of murders yeah, happening yeah no after it's down like 80%. i think th i think the murder rate is lower in el salvador now than it is in canada for and a month so, yeah. yeah for for the last yeah. month so yeah and so <laughs> it's kind of interesting that at the same time as i hear they're making it more and more difficult for canadians to immigrate here uh, or trying to at least yeah they're also saying el salvador is so dangerous you don't want to travel there and, and there's a lot of canadians that will hear that and say oh wow i can't go there you know yeah um but so I think it's important that we all share what life is really like here. And, you know, as much as I like, I <laughs> don't want to engage with uh, the normies back in Canada who are like, who are vilifying us and attacking us. I, I do want to share the truth about what's happening here with anybody who's willing to listen. And I want to get it out there and be vocal because uh, I'm very, very frightened at the direction of Canada. And I, and I still hope that, 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 that direction can change. I'm doubtful. I think they have to hit rock bottom before they're going to turn around and they have to see the sort of consequences of the policies that they're following. They have to come to, you know, they have to like pay the piper for that. Yeah. And when that happens, I think they'll hit rock bottom and, and people will wake up and, and demand change. But I, I just see it continuing to trend downhill. And I think uh, more and more Canadians are waking up and starting to realize that they can have a better life abroad. And I see it. Like I, I really do have people contacting me all the time asking me about like, you know, what's life like there? Like, it, yeah, just trying to make it work, right? It's complicated. I know. Yeah. It's it's a scary thing to to pick up your life and move it to a new country, but it can be done. I think that's part of what makes the community here so rich is that kind of self-selection sifter, the people that you know really believe in freedom and really want to, you know, start something new and positive mm -hmm. are the ones that are willing to pick up and leave. And so, yeah. I think we're actually seeing a a brain gain come to El Salvador where we're seeing people with real skills and real yeah. abilities and real capital flooding into El Salvador because they want to be part of building the future. Yeah. And the people that are kind of scared and, you know, the more hesitant to, to take a chance are the ones that are not coming. And so I think because of that, it's just been going to become more and more dynamic here yeah. in El Salvador That's a good and point. more exciting place to live. Yeah, actually, I never thought about that, but like the self-selection I think is real because I think if, if you're the type of person you're in a, in a career where you're like planning on working there for the next 30 years and retiring and getting your pension, those are the people that are having a very hard time. Like, I can't leave this. Like, I, yeah. I have to do what I have to do to keep this job and this pension. And uh, I think it's, you have to make a very difficult decision to walk away from that and decide that like, you know, you're, you're freedom and your family's freedom and your family's future to be able to live in line with your own values is more important than, you know, your material well-being and security. And so that's the difficult decision that a lot of people in Canada and other countries have to make right now that um, it's not easy, but like really got to do some soul searching and ask yourself that. Yeah. Well, what uh, what projects do you have that you're working on or do you have anything that, that we can promote or shill here at the end? Are you... I'm assuming you're on Twitter since you're a yeah. Bitcoiner, and uh, so so give people your your Twitter handle sure. or projects you're excited about or other Bitcoin companies here that you've seen that that you want to kind of help support. Any anything that you think would bring value to the Bitcoiners out there? Yeah. So first off, uh, on Twitter you can find me at Men's Coach underscore Tom. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. I try to speak out about what's happening in Canada quite a bit. I try to you know speak out about the good things happening in El Salvador. So you can find me there, get in touch. If you want, have questions about coming to El Salvador, um, want to talk to me, I'm happy to answer questions. I know a lot of people reach out to me. I try to answer everyone. Um, my wife, uh, I can't remember her Twitter handle, but uh, she is um, active on Substack, writing a blog about our journey coming here and everything we've done since we left Canada. Um, she's great at writing. And, um, and so her Substack is called Life Lessons from Abroad. 
and maybe we can put it in the show notes or something. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I think we, we had some pictures of your guys' family. Maybe uh, Andy can pop those up just to give people a little background. I, sorry, okay. I was I was so enthralled with our back and forth. I, <laughs> no, I, I forgot to remind uh, Andy to throw those up there. I wasn't even sure if they'd so, been up there. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. You can see our sunburn, especially my sunburn <laughs> face there. But uh, yeah, so projects. So we're, we bought this property. That's keeping us busy right now. We're, we're looking at like, you know, building a road in there. We're building, going to build a cabin. Is it, is it a big property? Or it's where? like half an acre. Okay. Um, it's beautiful though. We just love it. It's, it's incredible views. It's got fruit trees everywhere. Um, you know, it's, it's it, not. Is huge. it, can you give us a general region? I don't want, I'm not asking you to dox yeah, I mean, it's it, within but, uh, half an hour of this, of Bitcoin beach. Okay. But and, it's in uh, the more of the mountains yeah, and stuff. There. It's higher okay. up. And so, yeah, we have this vision of building like a few rental cabins and, and building our home and having, like you said, actually, like a place for Bitcoiners to yeah. gather, like where we could have dinners and get people to come together. Um, yeah. And, and so we go, we want to start s small and slowly, like building a cabin for ourselves to live into that would eventually become a rental cabin. Yeah. And so that would be this year's project. Get water, electricity. Uh, we're super into growing food. We've got a ton of fruit trees there. We want to plant more. So that's exciting, like planting papaya trees, banana trees, um, like maybe getting chickens, things like that. And so we're very busy with that. Um, we have multiple projects on. One thing is we homeschool our kids and that's the thing I want to be more involved in. Um, you know, I really regret, I look back on uh, the last maybe nine years of my life since my da oldest daughter was born. And I, I often think that I, I wish I hadn't taken on so much. Like, um, you know, I was studying to be a CPA and took like coaching programs. And, and I spent a lot of evenings in my basement doing multiple choice questions and studying and for all these exams, trying to become somebody and maybe impress people or whatever with, uh, achievements and, and then realizing, um, that I missed out on a lot of my kids, um, growing up because of that stuff and focusing more on them now as a priority. So going to be looking at homeschooling them, getting more involved in that, making sure they get like a top quality education. And, uh, so, but the other project we have is my wife and I are, we decided that we really want to tell more of our story and the experience of bringing a family here because there's like a lot of great uh, internet personalities talking about El Salvador, but we feel like the one thing lacking is people talking about uh, bringing a family here, like sort of freedom-minded uh, Bitcoiners, bringing kids here, raising kids here, homesteading, um, buying property, building a home and a, like a farm or a little farm, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we we are going to launch podcast show um, awesome. call like we our tentative rate, name right now is the freedom family and we don't know if that'll be the final name but so we're working on that behind the scenes and uh so there will be more to come definitely let us know when that comes out so we can you yeah. know, post it on our our twitter feed yeah for sure i will love to um but i think that's as far as it goes uh for projects for us right now okay yeah well, we'll look forward to getting some pictures of your cabin when you get that up and going. Yeah, uh, I mean, I hope to advertise it to Bitcoiners and yeah. make it the place that people want to stay, you know, ocean view up in the mountains, a little cooler climate and uh, close enough to come surfing and then go back up there. Perfect. Perfect. Well, it's it's been so fun to, to have you here today. It's, um, you know, seeing your young family and thinking, you know, that they're similar age. Your kids are similar to the, when my kids, they were young. They were that age when we came here. And cool. here we are, you know, 10 years later. So seeing you, you know, on that journey and remembering all the, the great times that, that I was involved. And, you know, obviously there's going to be ups and downs like anything in life. But um, for me, it's exciting and encouraging to see families with a hope for the future and this energy that are choosing to make El Salvador home and want to invest in this country and and really make it a beacon for freedom and hope so i mm -hmm. um, excited that you're part of that cohort and know that you know there'll be lots of people that come behind you that will kind of make this happen so we will uh we'll have to get you back on and uh you know the next year sometime and get some updates on how everything's going but uh for now thank you for uh sharing with us and thank you for having me and thank you for everything you've done with the Bitcoin Beach project, because, uh, I mean, I, I have to say, if it wasn't for you and this whole thing launching and El Salvador being inspired to go on this journey, we probably wouldn't be here. So thank you that we're even here doing this. Oh, it's been a, a fun thing to be a part of. So awesome. Okay. Thanks.